Um, I choose, chose this title mainly because it was almost given to me. And uh, I will try and uh, illustrate some concepts on how we understand the human brain these days. Um, consciousness is not the same as awareness, but in general terms we, uh, we, um, uh, we uh, use awareness as a sort of a metaphor for what consciousness... This is an ill-defined problem. This one we can describe so that you and I can understand it. So let's use that one. So it's a pragmatic and instrumental way of using the word. Uh, it entails uh, an idea that we are able to keep information in our mind about the external world. And uh, the concept validity around this is always questioned, and I, uh, I agree with that. And it has been challenged over time and, uh, that uh, consciousness in, is an illusion. But I'll discuss around this problem and uh, end up with a conclusion. And you can always ask, where, where am I in all this? We discuss, I am a person, I am somebody. And where is, the, where is the limit between me and somebody else's consciousness? That's also a good question. And do animals have consciousness and a concept of self? That's also a very basic biological question. <laughs> you can illustrate that the... the the uh, sort of the idea to know where you and yourself end is not always uh, conceptually easy to understand for a, a dog. However, most people, most people uh, are, f are uh, fully aware of where I am and where I end, so to speak. And sometimes we end a little bit before we end. We can, there are, uh, for instance, neurological issues with the alien hand, that is not my hand. Uh, it's an uncommon uh, neuropsychiatric phenomenon that, that has been described. The idea that we can um, harbor information about the external world also means that we may sometimes be right and we may sometimes be wrong. It also entails the fact that Sometimes we make up a, uh, information around what we find based on what we already had sto have stored within ourselves. Uh, and this is one, one of those famous illusions that, that challenge sort of the correctness of our mind. Uh, many of you can, uh, can see the, the, uh, the white triangle and you can even see the border between... Uh, between the white here and the white there, and there's a typical clear border there, but it's not there. It just happens to sort of you make it up because it has to be a white triangle on top of the other ones, and there, therefore there should be a contrast between the two. So this is an example where sort of your interpretation of this percept is skewed towards something that is not correct when you really challenge the problem. But then again, it also demonstrates that we are able to make up concepts of what we see. Aha, a triangle, therefore it should be. So we have information coming in and information going down. Bottom up and top down has to meet. And here it meets in a somewhat unfortunate way, in the way that we, uh, uh, the way that we uh, look upon the world. And sometimes we can ask a question, do I really hear what I hear? So let's make an experiment. Let's, uh, experiments are fun. You have been exposed to science and experiments are fun. So let's do a real experiment. Uh, let's split the audience here and you guys close your eyes. All of you close your eyes. May, hey, keep your eyes closed, I'm looking at you. And I will run a little film. Keep your eyes closed and, that, and the other ones, please look at the, uh, look at the screen. Ba, ba. Ba, 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 ba. Thank you. You can open your eyes. You heard a guy saying something, right? Yes. Did he say a T? If you answer yes by raising your hand, not by saying anything, and you keep your hand down if it's not a yes. Anybody heard a T? You should also answer the question. Anybody heard a K? Anybody heard a B? 
Okay, that part of the science. You were looking down at your computer, Richard. <laughs> Anybody heard a D? Yeah, that. So, you heard the same thing, yet you guys identified it as a D, and you guys identified it as a B. Strange. So, let's redo the experiment. We should always redo, replicate our findings, right? That's part of the experimental science. So, you guys close your eyes, and you guys look at the screen. Ba, 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 ba. Thank you. And we can repeat. Anybody heard this one? Anybody heard this one? Anybody heard this one? You change your minds, guys? <laughs> Anybody heard this one? <laughs> nah, this is strange. So we have here a real world experience that you guys know is the same hearing this, yet you make a different interpretation based on something irrelevant, like watching a hairy guy say something stupid on a film. <laughs> so how do you do this one? Well, this is just to demonstrate that like any computational problem, brain is re relying on statistics. And the statistics are simple. Seeing things, I know what I see. Hearing things, well, people speak with Scanian accents and Danish and Dutch accents, and it's terrible, you can't hear what they're saying, right? So, in spite of the fact that you are full, uh, can see things, and uh, are fu uh, have, full, uh, uh, have full hearing, you still use your visual information. And the visual information will lock into the interpretation at one consonant, whereas without uh, that information, you will lock into another one. And your locking in is the top-down, locking in, trying to make sense of the percept. So, what, what have I done? Well, I've, done, I create, I've used this uh, known, very known illusion called the McGurk effect. Uh, I know, used this known illusion, and I used the same consonant, only with a slight difference. D is something that goes with your palate, and B is your lips, but it's the same sort of uh, consonant sound. And you can try it again. Uh, you can try it again. Open and close your eyes at free will, if you will. Ba, ba. Ba, 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 ba. And in spite of the fact ba, ba, that you keep on ba, doing it, ba, you still change ba, ba. back and forth. Ba, 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 ba. It's a really strange ba, experience. Ba. <laughs> and, and, and the thing is, you're now, at the, you're now at the problem where a basic percept challenges your known about the, the outer world. So let's try and build a brain then. So now we have, now we have shown that, that uh, consciousness or at least an idea about the outer world is there. We can put the information into the brain. That information can be met in two different ways, either correct or not correct. So let's build a brain. This is the simplest brain that I know. It's a brain. It can, do th it can create action and it can, ha it can have a perception. That's the simple automatic brain. It can have a, some sort of representation, or it can just use itself as an automatic reaction machine. That's what we like ants to be. But are we, do we use automata? Yes, we do. And we can build in thinking skills, etc. But we always have the problem that the clock of the world is very quick. But we are very slow. After all, it's a big issue, this timing thing. Think about it. Your computers run at the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers a second. The brain has a maximum speed of 150 meters a second. Yet, we can do things in real time complex things, like walking. <clears throat> and walking is very strange. We can do that, and while talking, two things at the same time, in spite of the fact that I'm a man. You wouldn't believe that, would you? 
So this means that there are things <coughs> that we do that we do not have a full concept. Let's do another experiment. Have you ever opened a bottle with another bottle? That's how you do it. Uh, no, there are no more bottles. So, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to establish here is the idea around how do we build a brain. Well, the the and the problem of timing, because timing is a real problem. Um, so, how do we effectively? Uh, make up for the difference in time between our slow brain and the world? Well, first of all, we don't play the consciousness film until a bit later. So, you can, you, so that we know a few hundred milliseconds after things happen, what really happened. We can, we can make the, the simple timing experiment. Hold out your finger like this. This is the finger. Uh, and then you touch your nose. And now I would like to ask you, now you can put down your tools and utensils. And now I would like to ask you, did anybody feel the nose touching the finger before feeling the finger touching the nose? <laughs> of course not. Of course not. The thing is, I as a neurophysiologist, I can measure and I can tell you that it's 18 milliseconds later that this guy ends up here than this guy. Yet they're the same. Ah, see, there, there's always somebody testing again. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so what does that mean? Well, that means that we are constantly making up what seems reasonable from all the diverging information, adding it into the consciousness sort of representation or the representation uh, of the world. One, one problem for this guy, if, if we have a very simple brain, is that all reactions come at the same time. And what shall we do with it? So we do like that and we go this way. It's like, it's like an amoeba. An amoeba is fun. Amoeba has no real brain, but it has reactions. It has uh, actions and perception. Stinks, go this way. Smells good, go this way again. Uh, stinks, what? Something changed, go in this direction. No real memory, only direct reactions. And there's no communication skills. Amoebas don't act in groups, really. But we do. So we had to invent, uh, along the evolutionary route, we had to invent ways of communication. And one of them was, of course, to signal, um, uh, uh, signal to the, the outer world. And one of them w is, of course, to signal with your body. You can signal fear. You can signal happiness. And you can signal, this is a very happy day. <laughs> Which means that you can use that for two things. You can use it for communication, but you can also use it to store states of mind over time. You know, have you, has anybody ever emba felt embarrassment? Really blushing, you know? The fun thing with that one is that first you blush, and then you get the feeling, I'm blushing, and then you blush even more, right? <laughs> And what, happen, what happens is, is, of course, that the body signals back to you as well. So you have both the sensory system for the world and for yourself, and you have to reconcile the two. And the last build of this evolutionary thing is that we split up, or we put another story, uh, uh, another level in the brain. So we have sort of a... a, a um, Pre, uh, representation of the present and a more formal uh, memory system, episodic memory system. That's a late, uh, rather late invention, this guy. And that allows us to have a richer representation, to have thinking where we can store information and put it back and forth in 
what we uh, what we have uh, present and the, and the previous memories. But the problem with this one is that this one is slow. And since it's slow, its timing towards the external world is absolutely useless. Have you ever seen a child bike for the first time? <laughs> they use all the muscles in the world, even those that we don't have names for. <laughs> so having gone through this, let's go in and look at the the sort of the general scheme for the brain. The outer world, the fast phylogenetically old system with automatic responses very well timed with the outer world, the built on layers of cognitive systems with the newest cortex on the top, memories in all of them, the more you get away from this one, the poorer the timing, but the better the thoughts. So it's like any administrative systems. <laughs> like, uh, you know, a boss knows everything, handles everything, but has a poor idea how to communicate with the public. And all learning, essentially, all learning that we deal with is trying to push it down towards being more and more automatic. That's why I can walk and talk at the same time. Because walking and talking, all I have to do is to fill in some things that I have to say. But the rest is done here, outside the shallow uh, representation of, uh, of consciousness. So good timing and being automatic is really where you want to go. And we have diseases, disorders, that affect this, autom uh, uh, this uh, automatic... Uh, change or change towards automaticity. One of them is dyslexia. If you take 10 healthy kids anywhere and give them pseudo words, and habado, uh, that they have to read, strange words, I don't even remember them yet. And if you show them one time, second time, third time, and each time you have shown the list of 18 or 20 of those words, uh, I think it was, I actually think it was 120 words that we did. You, you can show that these guys read without errors and they can actually retrieve the words and know whether they've seen them or not, sort of in a good way. You can repeat the experiment. So the, these guys have that type of learning curve. If you then take uh, the same amount, number of kids uh, that ha have been diagnosed with dyslexia, you can see that their learning curve for unknown words is far slower, and you can repeat that. So you have some, some procedural effects, uh, first time, second time. But still, it's still much more difficult for the, uh, these to learn. And if you then look into the brain and have them read for the first time really easy words. Balloon, ball, foot, shoe. And you look at the the, uh, the, the way the, uh, this is handled in the brain, you can, you can see that when you make a direct comparison between the dyslexics and the uh, non-dyslexic, the dyslexics still use the newer areas, the higher order cortices, uh, when they perform the exact same thing, just demonstrating that they had a slower route towards automatization of this one. So this arrow is slower when, when you're in... Uh, so this is just a demonstration of the principal concepts that we're trying to deal with, namely information coming in, information controlling that, uh, or, uh, or a stream of uh, inner representation that controls that one. So inner representation means that I have an idea of the, the external world. And we can demonstrate that very easily. You can, I can put this one here. I can look at it and then I can close my eyes and then I can go around the bottle and find the glass, right? Which means that I can, I can make a model which is external to me and I can update it. Uh, Models for how my behavior should be in the lower levels are difficult to update. How many of you use, do not use ten fingers on the keyboard? How many of you do not use ten fingers on the keyboard? Okay. 
of you, you guys that held up your hand, how many of you would like to use 10 fingers on the keyboard? Yeah? Okay, about half of you. Why don't you? <laughs> you can't learn it. Well, you can learn it, but you have an imprinted automatic behavior, which is quite automatic, which means that you can go Q, W, E, R, T, Y. You, you can do it, but then somebody comes in and says, Hello, Richard, and you go... <laughs> so you go back to your automatic behavior. The, represent, the, the represented information, as I already demonstrated to you, can, uh, is effective, but not always correct. And using a model creates what we call an, uh, an, a function of expectancy or uh, anticipation. So we can make up a general expectation model. You have sensory information coming in. You compare that to, to what you expect. With that, you create your subjective experience, and you make some uh, different actions also into the emotional domain. You store some sort of information, thereby you update your expectancy. And by updating your expectancy, you can meet the world in a better way. So we have sort of learning expectancy put into the same model. So the idea is by regulating around in this model and mocking around, we can get the more effective information processing, we can have an internal model for the expected value, and we can regulate all, uh, in all domains and minimize the recomputation ne necessity, i.e. we save brain work by having a model. I don't have to re-represent the room all the time. I can just say that it looks about the same, so I won't bother with it. It's a way of handling information. So let's look into a manipulation of this model. How many minutes do I have? We started at 10, I think, right? Five more minutes? It said 45 in the program, minus 10, so 35. So essentially, I would ask for uh, 15 minutes more. 10 more minutes, but you are, uh, you are quite interested, so. <laughs> <laughs> That reminds me, when I was uh, a kid, uh, I, uh, I w was in my father's lab, and there was a, a um, Russian scientist uh, came into the room, and he came in and said, oh, I like this, I'm very interesting, I'm very interesting. <laughs> it was a bit difficult. So let, let's look at this uh, from the pain system. We have a pain system, you have nociception, pain signals coming up, and we have regulation going down, and we do that in order to handle pain, right? So, uh, pain means we have to know where it hurts, how much it hurts, and what should I do about it. It's like any administrative system. And then, uh, we, have, uh, we have put anatomy on this, essentially. So we know what's going up and what's going down. So we can, we can muck around in that system. Uh, so first of all, we can, we can uh, send in uh, hurtful information and ha activate the, com uh, comparat uh, the, uh, the comparison, and then we can move upwards uh, uh, with what we would... I don't expect it to hurt. It hurts, so light up the things and redo the recalculations for hurt. Well, so then we find sort of the anatomical space that I defined before, the signal going north. We can also change the reactivity by, for instance, carry different types of genes, thereby differentiating the pain response just on the fact that we have a different basic function of the nervous system. We can also teach the experiment. This is a wonderful experiment. This is a wonderful experiment. Uh, here we pointed a light and then we tickled them under the foot. That's fun. So what, what would we get then? We would get S1, S2, M1, M2. So we, 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 get, we, we get the signal that we want. And we do that for a while. And since we're scientists, we manipulate our experiment. So then we shine the light and do not tickle them under the foot. So what happens? Well, after when we've done that ten times, 
we sort of we re-replicate the expectancy system because we have taught the system with past experiment to uh, expect being tickled under the foot. And we can also uh, install insecurity in the system. So we can, we can tell people that in one minute you will be exposed to a safe but painful electric shock in the right finger. Ah. Uh, Mew. Sorry, that's the wrong text. Sorry, that's the wrong text. The, the instruction here was, in one minute, you will, be, uh, uh, you will be exposed to a shock. Or, in two minutes, you will be exposed to a shock. But we all measured it during the first minute. So we ended up being able to manipulate the fear system just by, um, by uh, giving a sort of a, a, an instruction uh, to the system early on. And the fun thing is, of course, that if something happens here, we would predict something would happen down there, right? And that's exactly what happened, uh, because this one sort of belongs to that one. So we can sort of go through the system that way. And here comes the experiment where we went with one, one minute uh, painful but safe, or we said one minute the same type of shock like one minute ago. So the first one installed, instilled insecurity, fear. The other one instilled security, because we know exactly what the stimulus is. So in insecurity, we don't know what to expect, calculate, 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 or we know exactly what to expect, don't worry about it. Get out, get, out of the, uh, get out of the system as you can. And then we, of course, can do rather explicit inductions in order to change the expectancy. And uh, that's normally called a placebo manipulation. So what we did is, in, this, in these high placebo responders, is that we went in and said that you are now getting a really good pain reliever, a new drug. It's called sodium chloride. <laughs> and then we gave them a standard uh, painful uh, uh, experience uh, and compared that to the non-painful uh, experience. And you get this sort of this recalculation. I didn't expect it to be this bad, so I better recalculate and better put on some more brakes on it. So this is the descending pain system trying to lock, uh, lock the painful experience, because I was told it wasn't going to hurt. And, and um, once we've done that, we can, of course, uh, sort of go through the system and make up a real, uh, uh, real connection scheme. And then we can try and really find out what's going to happen and make some predictions. What we did when we, had a, when we made this, uh, this, this anatomical diagram that we tried to put function into and tried to sort of go both from the model point of view and from the physiological experimental point of view and from the theoretical point of view, is that we found out uh, some ideas that we, we, th we thought that chronic pain means that your pain, um, your descending pain system is not functioning very well. So we did that experiment in patients with fibromyalgia and found out that this region lights up very good in experimental inflicted pain in normals, but not in the, in, in, in the, um, uh, not in the um, uh, patients. And then we did cognitive behavioral therapy because we thought that would be a good idea because we know that that, that one should work. And what should we expect? Well, first of all, we should expect that they get better. Second of all, we should, uh, we should see something that points towards this one. And we know that this region points to that one and uh, has a regulatory role for that one. And following cognitive behavioral therapy, we notice that this anterior insular region actually lit up uh, in a way to sort of pounder on that one. But we did some more things. 
we also asked in an uninformed way, um, uh, uninformed uh, algorithm to see, is there any difference between the patients that have gone through cognitive behavioral therapy versus those uh, that have, uh, has not? And we were able to demonstrate that uh, when we just ask, uh, we, we, t we, take the, we take all the data, put it in a computer and ask the computer, what factors do you see in this system? And it turns out that there were two factors uh, that were very important, and suddenly all the, the treated patients ended up in this corner, giving us a sort of an external idea or an external view on how we could see the effects of cognitive behavioral therapy. This, uh, this paper is under, uh, under publication. But this also tells us that we can't, cannot see one anatomical region uh, as explaining a full function. It's always a network function. So here, here we did a placebo analgesia to teach people and, uh, and also uh, and to look at how the networks work together. So when we do a placebo analgesia, that same region is related to this, uh, this descending region in a proper way, whereas if we just give a drug and hit directly on this region, there is no functional relation between the two, telling us that the combination of cognitive behavioral therapy and uh, and drug therapy is probably the way to go because they have different mechanisms and we need both. We need to teach a, a system that has gone into chronicity uh, in order to come back to sort of normal, uh, normal function in the system. So, the conclusion is that a model-driven approach to add understanding of the physiological expression as a result of manipulations of a conscious experience is fruitful. And consciousness, yes, it may be an illusion, albeit a very useful one. <laughs> and I end up with my new favorite. After the discovery of antimatter and dark matter, we have just confirmed the existence of doesn't matter, <laughs> which, does have, which does not have any influence on the universe whatsoever. Thank you for your... <laughs> <laughs>